Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira, on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events to have taken place around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Iran given a fresh chance to integrate with the global economy, deal allowing sanctions relief in return for a clampdown on its nuclear weaponization achieved in Vienna with repercussions worldwide. Greece pulled back from the brink of a euro exit as it bows to European Union demands on stringent reform measures. Parliament clears plan amid strong public protest. The implementation promises to be steep. Iraqi military launches fresh offensive to take back the country's largest province, Anbar, from militants. But it's tough going with massive Islamic State reprisals. The latest attack killed over 100. And it's one year since a Malaysian Airlines passenger plane was shot down over Ukraine, killing all 298 people on board. Memorial services held in nations around the world, even as the blame game continues on who was responsible. Our top story on the program this week. There's a deal at last on limits to Iran's nuclear program in exchange for easing of sanctions, potentially making the or rather marking the beginning of a new era in relations between Iran and the West. The deal between Iran and six world powers brings to an end a 12-year standoff that had threatened to trigger a new war in the Middle East. Besides an array of bigger global repercussions, here's more. Celebrations in Tehran on a chance to end years of isolation, a chance to undo years of stifling sanctions, hopes again of an improved life, many call it a rebirth. Hope for better lives for their children are coming closer to developed nations of the world, a dramatic break from decades of animosity with the United States. Because a nuclear deal, though festooned with limitations on their country's nuclear ambitions, is now a reality. The E3, EU plus three and the Islamic Republic of Iran welcome this historic joint comprehensive plan of action, which will ensure that Iran's nuclear program will be exclusively peaceful and mark a fundamental shift in their approach to this issue. They anticipate that full implementation of this joint comprehensive plan of action will positively contribute to regional and international peace and security. Talks towards this landmark accord have spanned weeks, the last 18 days in Vienna being the most intense phase of frequently missed deadlines and fractious negotiations. The deal on one hand means billions of dollars in relief from sanctions on Iran. On the other, it imposes strong checks extending over the next decade. At the outset, the deal imposes strong checks on uranium enrichment abilities by limiting stockpiles, centrifuges and facilities. It stresses on redesigning nuclear-capable reactors. There's also a strong transparency clause laying down scrutiny by IAEA inspectors when mandated by a Western majority arbitration panel. The sanctions snap back into place if at any time the laid-down obligations go unfulfilled. In return, and after all verifications on commitments, all US and EU nuclear-related sanctions will be suspended. Iran will get some access to currently restricted sensitive technologies. Iran's forward-looking president Hassan Rouhani, widely credited with easing the country's extremist outlook, stresses the importance his country places on regional security and stability, assuring Iran's commitment to the deal. For U.S. President Barack Obama, the accord marks fulfillment of a key foreign policy goal. He heralds it as an opportunity for long-time foes to move in a new direction. The need for ratification by the U.S. Congress remains a sizable hurdle. Republicans in Congress looking to block the agreement comes as a threat of sorts. I am confident that this deal will meet the national security interests of the United States, and our allies. So I will veto any legislation that prevents the successful implementation of this deal. 
It also has to be endorsed by the UN Security Council. After all that, the deal itself raises a host of geopolitical and strategic possibilities. Trade, the impact on global oil prices, the like. Which way the outcome swings in the short and long term is keenly watched. Iran certainly will prioritize relations with China and Russia and India and perhaps some countries in the European Union. Whether this leads to some sort of thaw with the United States, whether the anti-Americanism that has been so important to the Iranian revolution, to Iranian political coherence diminishes, I think is something that's very hard to read. It's an agreement between Iran on one hand and six world powers, US, Britain, France, Germany, Russia and China on the other. But beyond these players, the impact goes much further. Some have praised it as a pathbreaker. Countries like Israel have slammed the deal as a global threat. What's certain is, it's a huge mover that promises paradigm changes ahead. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, joining me for a chat uh, this week on the program, of course, is uh, former Ambassador Sheel Khan Sharma. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador, for joining me on the program. You know, as far as this nuclear deal is concerned, of course, it brings to an end a 12-year standoff between Iran and uh, the West. But uh, how is it really going to impact the West and Iran in particular? Iran will benefit uh, because the sanctions will be lifted, which were hurting it. And as President Rouhani said, that the sanctions were not successful in breaking Iran's resolve, mm. but they were effective in uh, giving pain to the people. And uh, as President Rouhani's statement uh, indicated, they are, Iran is a country which uh, values its people and it, you know, they have elections. And so what the uh, jubilations on the street show is a, set, is a sense of people's participation mm. in this uh, whole uh, breakthrough. So Iran is relieved uh, of the 12-year-long, uh, uh, you know, uh, clamping down of sanctions on everything, on its oil uh, uh, and its uh, technology transfers and its imports. So the sanctions were very exhaustive and they were for, uh, even more strengthened after 2012. Mm. So this lifting of sanctions is a big thing for Iran and the even uh, the the supreme leader of Iran has welcomed it. Now, as far as Iran's interlocutors are concerned, they wanted to ensure that in exchange for lifting of sanctions, Iran's pathways mm. for making nuclear weapons are blocked. And President Obama has made it very clear how those four pathways are blocked. Iran's uranium enrichment uh, will be scaled down considerably and its stockpile of even 3.75% uh, enriched uranium will be brought down to just 300 kilograms. Mm. Mm. Second, Iran will not go for a plutonium production reactor. Third, the IAEA will keep monitoring Iran's uh, program very closely so that Iran cannot sneak out or cannot mm. do it uh, you know, clandestinely. Fourth, Iran re will remain uh, as part of the NPT, so the breakout dimension is not there. And the uh, Iran will conform to the IAEA safeguards and the additional protocol for more than 25 years. Indeed. So, so these four uh, are very important, uh, uh, you know, blockades on Iran's uh, suspected program. Hmm. Iran has always maintained that its program is for peaceful. Indeed. And it has a right under the NPT to develop nuclear uh, enrichment and nuclear power for peaceful purposes. It also has a nuclear reactor in Bushehr. And it wants to have more reactors. So... Iran's case is also respected in that mm, sense. Mm. Uh, and uh, the world community f heaves a sigh of relief because Iran was a major power in the Middle East. Indeed. Its economy is large. And if it is integrated into the global economy, then it will give a push for uh, growth because mm, the global mm. economy is, you know, teetering on a very low growth. Sure. So... Iran's uh, integration with the global economy will be win-win for everyone. Hmm. Would you say that, you know, this is the beginning of a new era for ties between the US and Iran? Would you see a further thawing of ties? Because we've seen in the past that both countries do have a history and a bad one at it. So are we going to see a thaw in relationship between the two countries? All indications seem to point to that. However, because of their domestic reasons, both Iran and the US, the leadership... Uh, 
are very cautious. Hmm. President Obama, in his statements, in his interview, and he had a very extensive press interview uh, two days back, where he made it very clear that the deal concerns only the nuclear program of Iran. And he has generally avoided going into the larger dimension. Hmm. And same way, Rouhani and uh, Zarif have focused on the deal. And even Khatami, their supreme leader, has continued to say that uh, the interlocutors are not trustworthy. So a larger kind of a, a rapprochement, each side is trying to uh, dispel any possibility of. Hmm. It, the reasons are that there is very strong opposition in both countries, the hardliners in Iran and the congressional opponents of President Obama, who might uh, jump onto any, any uh, signs of a thaw. Indeed. And they would say, look what Iran is doing in uh, Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, are you going to uh, allow that? So that's a much more complicated game. Mm. And then US allies in the Middle East are in the Gulf countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and Israel, which is, a st Indeed. is Indeed. the strongest ally. They have all been in the forefront demanding complete stoppage of all enrichment in Iran mm, mm. and to remove any possibility of Iran going nuclear. Indeed. Is it a difficult pill now for all of these, you know, countries to swallow at the moment, especially Iran, considering that Netanyahu's stand all throughout the deal? Israel, you mean? Yeah, Israel. Well, you know, this is something which is uh, what uh, up is uppermost in the minds of U.S. government. So you found... Uh, uh, President Obama in his interview with John, with uh, Tom Friedman two days through three years back. Mm -hmm. Then John Kerry was also on the interview with uh, Amanpour. And uh, the U.S. Uh, State Department has gone into, uh, you know, full drive. They are trying to explain to their Gulf allies and to Israel that uh, nothing of this erodes the U.S. security commitment mm -hmm. to these countries. Mm -hmm. And President Obama actually has, in his question-answer session, uh, dispelled all doubts. He said that uh, U.S. is even more strongly committed to Israel's security. Right. And the Iron Dome, which is the missile defense setup mm -hmm. in, in Israel, he said this has been further strengthened. So, and he said that any uh, threat to Israel will be treated as threat to the United States. So Indeed. that kind of a, a close uh, uh, cooperation between Israel and so U.S. So everyone's interests have been taken care of is what you're saying. So we'll have to leave it at that, Ambassador. Thank you so much for joining us Thank on the program you. and putting things into perspective Thank for you. us. On that note, of course, we'll slip into a short break now, but still to come, NASA's landmark flyby past the planet Pluto shows ice mountains on the surface comparable to the biggest on Earth. We'll have that and much more after this short break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. On to the other big international story of the week now. Greece finally pulled back from the brink and near dying down of Grexit fears. The Greek parliament accepting its government's debt deal reached with creditors and passing the first round of reforms. EU finance ministers agreeing to a bridge loan to tide over the immediate crisis and an overall acceptance of the need to move forward suggests the worst may be over. Though there's no denying the huge implementation challenge Greece faces. Here's a report. The Greek parliament, the biggest test for austerity reforms Prime Minister Cyprus had ultimately bowed to. The debate was fierce enough Cyprus had to lean on pro-EU parties as members of his own Syriza party, including some senior ministers, pulled out. But in the end, it's through. In exchange for funding worth up to 86 billion euros, Greece has accepted significant pension adjustments, increases to VAT and overhaul of its collective bargaining system, measures to liberalise its economy and tight limits on public spending. 
each of the EU nations are in the process of getting the bailout package ratified by their respective parliaments. On Thursday, EU finance ministers agreed on a 7 billion euro bridge loan to Athens to pay IMF areas, so it remains involved in bailouts. Banks are expected to reopen on Monday after nearly three weeks of capital controls, with the European Central Bank boosting emergency funding for the financial sector and throwing its weight behind debt relief for Athens. All indications of Grexit fears winding down, at least for now. I'm okay with what uh, our Greek friends have done, and I'm, I'm hopeful and confident that this time we will reach the results uh, we have to reach, because this is not about Cyprus, not about his government, not about Juncker, not about the Commission, it's about the Greek people. There's no refusing the strong anti-reforms voice within Greece. Protests have broken out across the country. Opponents have termed the severe measures to be imposed a social suicidal genocide. Pushing further with stringent reforms, rescuing a near-insolvent banking system will be a tough task even when passions cool. Efforts by nations of the grouping to keep it intact have yielded results. Taking that forward is the challenge now. Europe has shown in these days, and especially during the last night, that we are capable to act in unity and solidarity and uh, it was the French-German cooperation which was working out a solution which was agreed by all the different members of the Eurozone. And it's now to the Greek government and to the Greek, to the Greek parliament to rebuild trust which is necessary to take the next decisions. Banks in Greece are set to reopen on Monday after a difficult three weeks of capital controls. Relief after the European Central Bank agreed to boost emergency funding and threw its weight behind calls for debt relief for Athens. The Greek Parliament cleared a first set of taxation and pension system reforms, paving the way for finalisation of the third Greek bailout. After edging towards the brink, at least the way forward is clearer. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. Well, let's now bring you a roundup of all the other international news of the week in our Globe Watch. Memorial services were held on Friday to mark the first anniversary of the MH17A disaster in which 289 people died. Australia, Netherlands and other countries where most of the passengers were from held special prayers. Villagers close to the crash site in Ukraine also held a memorial meet. Russian-backed rebels were widely believed to have shot down the Malaysian Airlines Boeing 777 as it flew from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Moscow blamed the Ukraine government for the disaster. A suicide car bomb blast in Khost province of Afghanistan on Sunday killed at least 33 people, mostly women and children. The bomber detonated explosives near Camp Champman that was formerly used by the CIA. The base now houses both Afghan and foreign troops, including US soldiers. No group has taken responsibility, although the Taliban has often targeted troops and launched a fresh offensive in late April. Khost borders Pakistan and is one of Afghanistan's most volatile provinces. War clouds moving again over the Gaza Strip. The Israeli military says its warplanes struck the Gaza Strip on Thursday in response to a rocket launched from the coastal area into southern Israel. Islamic militants in Gaza have claimed responsibility for sporadic rocket fire into Israel in recent months. During last summer's war between Israel and the Hamas group in Gaza, more than 2,200 Palestinians and 73 people on the Israeli side were killed. The war disrupted the lives of millions of people as they coped with rocket attacks and air raid sirens. The FBI is investigating an attack on two military centers in Tennessee by a gunman who killed four Marines before being shot dead by police. A district lawyer in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where the incidents happened, said the shootings were being investigated as an act of domestic terror, though the FBI clarified there was no terror link. The gunman, who was also shot dead, was named as 24-year-old Mohammed Yusuf Abdulaziz and local reports said he was born in the Middle East. Images from NASA's New Horizons probe during its historic flyby of planet Pluto show mountains of ice as high as the Rockies on the surface. They also show signs of geological activity on Pluto and its moon Charon. NASA scientists presented the first pictures taken from the spacecraft on Wednesday, hours after it swept past getting as close as 12,500 km and grabbing a huge volume of data. Scientists say the surface suggests some geological process like volcanism in the last 100 million years.
Moving on, now Iraqi security forces launched a counter-offensive against Islamic State militants on Monday with a focus on retaking IS-infested parts of the country's largest Anbar province adjoining joining capital Baghdad. The move is also a major test to bring the country's diverse and fractured fighters on a common front against jihadist militants. Here's a report. A joint operation by the Iraqi military, federal police and militia. Their target, regaining Fallujah and more importantly Ramadi, capital of Anbar province, that fell to the Islamic State two months back. The Tikrit operation in March had relied on Shiite militia. This one depends more on Sunni tribal fighters besides the conventional force. Ground fighters are supported by airstrikes west and north of Baghdad, even as they come up against strong rebuttals from Islamic State insurgents. Reports say the initial attacks focused on Fallujah, west of Baghdad and state capital Ramadi. The forces staged early morning raids against IS targets along the Euphrates River. The Islamic State captured about a quarter of Iraqi territory last year, virtually all of it in Sunni-dominated areas. This is obviously an operation that's led by the Iraqi military, uh, but those forces that are operating under the command and control uh, of the Iraqi central government uh, can't expect to have the support of the United States and our coalition partners uh, as they undertake these operations. The Anbar operation coincides with the arrival of the first batch of F-16 fighter jets from the U.S. Four F-16s of the 36 order that have arrived are to be deployed in the fight against Islamic State militants. Preparing the force for a longer-term fight is the ultimate objective. The IS has struck back too, and in a way it knows best. A spate of car bombs and suicide attacks in and around Baghdad killed and wounded dozens. The jihadists are known to send in bombers to the capital regularly. In Fallujah, though the government opened what it called a secure passage for civilians, residents say they fear being attacked by the IS if they approach the government-patrolled safe zone. The militants using civilians as human shields is not unknown. Indications enough that the fight will be a long and tough one. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, shifting focus now, it's time to bring you up to speed with all the sports news that you might have missed this week. Here's our sports action. Real Madrid have failed to win the domestic championship for the third season in a row, but the Spanish soccer giant is still dominant globally on the financial front. For the third year in a row, Real have been named the most valuable sports team in the world by Forbes, fending off competition from American football and Major League Baseball. The 10-time European champion is uh, valued by the business magazine at $3.26 billion, while the NFL's Dallas Cowboys and MLB's New York Yankees are in joint second at $3.2 billion. US dollars. The U.S. Tennis Association on Tuesday announced that the U.S. Open men's and women's singles champions will earn a record $3.3 million each at the tournament. The total tournament purse will be $42.3 million, which is 10.5% more than the previous year. The payout for each round in singles is also going to rise by at least 10%. The runners-up will receive $1.6 million, while a player who loses in the first round will make $39,500. The winning doubles team will get $570,000. Italian rider Ivan Basso, riding for Tinkoff Saxo, quit the Tour de France on Monday after revealing that he had testicular cancer. The two-time Giro d'Italia winner was due to be a key support rider for teammate Alberto Contador during the course of this year's tour. But instead, the 37-year-old returned to Italy for treatment. Basso was operated on to remove his left testicle because of the presence of a tumour known as a simionoma on Wednesday. He was later discharged from hospital. James Faulkner, Australia's man of the match in the World Cup final, has been suspended for four matches and will not be considered for the limited overs matches that follow the Ashes. While playing for Lancashire, Faulkner crashed his car and was found to have been more than twice over the legal blood alcohol limit. Faulkner spent the night in the custody of Manchester Police and will face court on the 21st of July. 
However, cricket Australia acted swiftly under the board's code of conduct to suspend the all-rounder. Not reputation, not rankings, not even rain could stop Bangladesh from clinching a first bilateral series win over South Africa and a fourth successive series triumph at home. Bangladesh dominated South Africa in every department, restricting them to a total of under 200 and then romping to the target themselves with 13.5 overs to spare. On the way, Shakib Al Hassan and Mashrafe Murtaza both picked up their 200th ODI wicket. Tamim Iqbal and Soumya Sarkar posted the best partnership for Bangladesh against South Africa and Soumya Sarkar scored the fastest 50 for a Bangladesh batsman against South Africa. And finally, here's something for the adrenaline pushers. The 2015 San Samin Bull Run Festival wound down in Pamplona, Spain this week. The week-long event saw eight bull runs and some high-voltage thrills and spills too. Enjoy this. I'm Frank Pereira saying goodbye. See you again next time.